Today, we're in Saudi Arabia searching for the route of the Exodus with Andrew Jones. So far in our In Grace special series, Exodus Found, we've retraced the steps of a people who started as slaves, but then were freed. Miracles have been plentiful, none greater than the parting of the Red Sea. We have seen evidence of Israel in Egypt and explored the probable crossing point. Now we're heading to Saudi Arabia. Why? Because we want to see where Midian might have been and search for the real Mount Sinai. My brother-in-law, Neil Darian, couldn't come on this part of the trip, but you'll still see him and I in studio on this episode discussing the biblical case for the location of the Exodus. Before we go to Saudi Arabia to see all the evidence of the Red Sea crossing on that side, I wanted to make a stop over here in Dubai to show you the Burj Khalifa Tower, the tallest building in the world, a half mile high. That is the same depth as the water in the middle of the Red Sea crossing. But listen, I don't think it's good enough to look at it from out here. I think we need to go up. Let's go. Can you imagine this much water crashing down upon the Egyptian army? Unbelievable. We made it to Saudi Arabia. I'm so excited because we're on this quest to find the real route of the Exodus. It seems strange to me that they don't know for sure where Mount Sinai is today, but we think we may have a bead on it. And we're going to be looking in the area of Northwest Saudi Arabia to see if we can find all the clues mentioned in the Bible as to the location, the real location of Mount Sinai. So buckle up, it's gonna be quite an adventure. We drove from our hotel in Hakkal down along the Red Sea's Gulf of Aqaba to the location directly across from Nueva. We were not allowed to scuba dive here in these Saudi waters, but we still wanted to explore where Israel likely walked ashore. Again, we were keeping our eyes peeled, looking for anything that looked like it might have come from the Egyptian army. Okay, folks, we're about to go snorkeling in the Saudi Arabia side of the Gulf of Aqaba and the Red Sea in the same water, the beachhead where they came ashore. And here we go. Welcome underwater, everybody. As we continue to look out, I was a little bit surprised how shallow it was. We were seeing the seagrass and the shallower waters, the small fish. We had to swim out what I felt was maybe about four or five blocks before we found any depth at all. All right, so this is my first reaction from swimming in the Gulf of Aqaba, the Red Sea on the Saudi side. First of all, I'm standing. You can see how far off from shore we are right now. So this is very gradual drop off. But as you look that way, look how it's just such a natural pitch up. There's lots of room for lots of people as they came up out of the sea. And as we would go further this way, if we could, it would be about 2,000 feet deep or more, maybe 2,500, 2,700 feet, but all at a natural slope. The rest of the Red Sea has these massive drop-offs and really deep points where it really wouldn't be plausible for people to be able to get in and back out. But this area from the way up to this point of the Red Sea, it's totally possible and probable 
And so this is an exciting opportunity for us to be able to show you what it's like to snorkel here at the Red Sea. And now we go back underwater, searching around, looking for anything we could possibly find that might resemble something from the Egyptian army. We're looking for anything round that would resemble a coral encrusted chariot wheel. I'm looking for anything that's metallic, maybe a sword or a spear, uh, maybe a piece of body armor. And although snorkeling is a little harder to get down and stay down, we're able to hold our breath and get down and examine the deeper waters where the reef began. And again, it's so beautiful. It's so incredible. Just if all we did was look down into the water at the corals and the fish and the, the life, it would be so worth it. It's so awesome. But although we didn't find anything here either, we still had an amazing experience on the Saudi Arabia side of the Gulf of Aqaba and the Red Sea. That was special, only because of what probably happened here. No, didn't find any chariot parts, uh, wheels. Obviously, that would be creme de la creme. But to be able to go in the water at this spot and see it for myself, priceless. Now they have made it through the Red Sea. This is the greatest miracle since creation, probably, that's ever taken place. This is a nation born. They're now born, they're now a nation, they're free. They will never go back to slavery to Egypt. God has taken care of that. And they were eyewitnesses to this. Certainly they turned around and they saw, first of all, maybe they thought they were gonna get captured, but then they saw the water start to collapse and destroy, pound this powerful army that would have easily taken them back. And they sing. Wow. And there are songs of Moses and a song of Miriam. Mm -hmm. And these are songs of deliverance. Amen. Like God has delivered us. And as they were standing there, and as I'm standing there on this beach, I'm just thinking about those songs mm. and the fact that God has done an incredible miracle. Wow. And all of that mm. has impacted my life, Neil. Mm. The reason is because my Savior was in that family. And from that tribe, the tribe of Judah, would eventually come a king named David, and from that king would come another king named Jesus. Wow. And so, because he's my savior, all of us that have put our trust in Christ were almost the same as going through that Red Sea. Certainly, every Jewish person right. went through that Red Sea. After recalling the birth of Israel on the shores of the Red Sea, we were ready to see what they would have seen. Adventurer Andrew Jones will guide us to many sites that tie into the Exodus story here in Saudi Arabia. Today, we're hoping to retrace their steps from the landing beach to several camp spots and oases, eventually to wind up at the real Mount Sinai. The Bible says that after crossing the Red Sea, Israel walked three days through the wilderness of Shur, or Etam, eventually coming to what would be known as Mara. So we're in kind of a basin area, and yeah. you think that this could be what is referred to as Mara, three days journey from the crossing site. Yes. They needed water. Yeah, the Bible says it was bitter. So you do have these pools that would have been filled up from the rain that they came across and been brackish or just undrinkable. And this area now is called Al-Sharef, and it was a Hajj route stop. So on the way to Mecca, this was one of the places people did stop and had wells of water. But uh, the groundwater here, you can see there's some dried basins behind us yeah. with camels. And so this is a possible site for Mara. In fact, there's some ancient, or I should say older maps about 100 years ago, and they do list a similar name to Mara in this region. Really? They spell it M-R-A-H. Huh. So the story was God told Moses to take a tree yeah. and throw it into the water, and the water turned from bitter to sweet. So you could imagine maybe one of the acacia trees yeah. in this area, cutting it down or part of the branch and throwing it into this brackish water. So cool. Oh, again, it's all fitting together. God is a specialist at making bitter things sweet. 
Naomi, Ruth's mother-in-law, is witness to this. After Mara, we wanted to find Elam, the next stop for Israel. The Bible describes that campsite as having 12 wells and 70 palm trees. Andrew knew of a spot that fit the bill, but it was way off the beaten path in the desert. And as we drove through the dry and mysteriously beautiful wilderness, we came upon this herd of camels. We're out here in Saudi Arabia, looking for an oasis, one of the oasis that the children of Israel would have stopped at. And we came across this herd of wild camels. You see all these little ones and they're nursing. Uh, beautiful creatures, incredible creatures. I'm hoping this one is um, nice, tame. Hi, how are you? Good to see you. Are you gonna be nice to me? Yeah, you're probably hungry, aren't you? Yes, you are. Yes, you are. You're a sweetheart. Do you know which way we should go to an oasis? Oh, that way? Okay, thank you. Good day to you, ma'am. Back in the car after our camel encounter, we soon arrived at Taib al Isam Oasis, which is very probably Elam. Oh, this is awesome, Andrew. Yeah, this is one of the best shots I like. Check it out. So you actually carved this out to, sh to give us a better view of <laughs> yes. the Oasis? I had a team show up a couple weeks ago. Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> but you look at it, it's like a little portal Check into the past. You see the uh, Wadi Taizm Oasis, the possible Elam site? This to me looks like a Hollywood film set. The orange rocks, and then you have this green, yeah. lush oasis. I, I don't even want to say this, but it almost looks fake. Did you, <laughs> is that a set? Did you build that? That's amazing. Yeah, so me. right in here, you're saying there's 12 wells. We've been driving through this area and there's like scrub brush and a few trees here and there. And then all of a sudden, boom, these yeah. big clumps of palm trees, not just trees, palm trees in the middle of a desert. I've always heard of Oasis. Now I've actually seen one. Yeah, this is a very beautiful one. That's cool. Andrew, I think it would be helpful if we take a moment to kind of get the lay of the land. We've identified the crossing point across from Nueva. And We've already been there and we looked at that. Mm -hmm. So where are we now and what route may they have taken to get to this oasis, which is possibly Elam? So if you look at the general region, we're here in Northwest Saudi Arabia, ancient Midian. Mm -hmm. So we're just past this point here on the map in this canyon system. It's known today as Wadi Taizm, and this means the Valley of the Good Name. Okay. Now, these ancient names are only used usually once in the Bible for the Exodus camping sites like Elam, Mara, Rephidim. And so it's hard to pinpoint them today. And those names are associated with what happened at the that time, time of Moses. Yeah. A lot of times they would have an event happen at a site, and then Moses would name it after right. what happened. Well, well, same with Mara. The water was bitter. So they call was it Mara. Mara. Mara right. Yeah, but we, so now we don't have like those names usually on a map. Uh -huh. So you got to use logic and reasoning sure. and kind of explore like we're doing, explore yeah. the area and try so to find them. The most important point of where was the crossing point, where's Mount Sinai, is that this is Midian. This is where Moses experienced God, the burning bush, the mountain of God was all already here. And he knew that because of Jethro, and this is where he had come for his 40 years in the wilderness. Yeah, they had a little detour, <laughs> but it was all in God's plan. Mm -hmm. Look at this. Wow, here we are. There's 12 of these. Yeah, we actually counted one year. Scattered among the oasis are 12. Hello! Kermit the frog's down there. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like he would die soon in that water. It doesn't yeah, look too good. <laughs> yeah, but these trees seem to be they enjoying like it. it. Yeah. yeah, no, it's a uh, good water for the vegetation. It's amazing though that there's palm trees and 12 wells here. In this desolate valley, yeah. nothing else growing. It would fit the narration of Exodus. Yeah, it's exactly. near the crossing site. Amazing. It, it fits the story. Incredible, wow. Also, not only are there 12 wells and all the palm trees, but you also have Midianite ruins and yeah. pottery found here. Right behind us actually are some of the Midianite ruins, and this is where they find the pottery pieces. And again, it shows that this oasis goes back to the time of the Exodus, because you're finding that the Midianites were living around these watering holes. Show me, show me uh, where Yeah, let's those, go up there and check it out. Yeah.
There's one right there. I found it. You sure did, wow. No, I'm gonna give you all the credit. So <laughs> no, just tell me tell me about this. We're above the Elam Oasis, the possible mm -hmm. Elam Oasis, and this is a Midianite uh, settlement that they had uncovered. Um, and archeologists say there's potter here. Sure enough, you find it. Just Look at that. Little and, pieces and you can tell, all broken around. And you can tell it's old just by the, the weathering and stuff on it. Oh yeah, for huh. sure. So it looks like you just picked up yeah, just some nice pieces. Look at that. Back behind us there on the hill. Huh. This is definitely pottery because it's, it's clay. Yeah, you can see the curve in it. Yeah, so um, that had some sort of a design to it. This one too, Again. you see the lines and the, yep. even if you look on the, the side profile, you see the layers. Mm -hmm. One side is lighter, the other side is amazing. Dark. On the Saudi archeological literature for this site, they mentioned that there has been Midianite pottery found. And right where they said the settlements were, you pick them yeah, up and there there's there. pieces laying around. Amazing, cool. All right, so one last uh, place I wanna walk is up to the top of that rock. Yeah, is that doable? View. Let's try it. Okay, you're gonna help me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> help each other. <laughs> Push. After leaving Elam, we wanted to find another oasis that could fit the Bible's next camp location for Israel. Numbers 33 verse 10 says that after Elam, they encamped by the Red Sea. Here at Magna is a beautiful oasis and I think a good candidate for the next camp spot. This is Magna. Magna. And so it's known as the Springs of Moses. Huh. You see, it's a coastal oasis right beside the Red Sea. Oh yeah. It has all these springs of water bubbling up out of the mud here. Let's go check out some of the springs down here. And anytime you find an oasis in these areas, you start to think this could have been one of the stops for Israel. Yeah, you know, they're always looking for water. They yeah. had their flocks and herds and one to two million people. And so, yeah, water was very important. Well, here down, uh, we have the, these springs of water bubbling up out of the mud. No kidding. In fact, you see little fish or tadpoles yeah. in there. Sure. Now, some of the locals in the past have told friends of mine that there used to be 12 of these in this area. And so, based on that, in the Exodus account, Elam had 12 springs. Mm -hmm. So, some have assumed that maybe this was Elam. Many others believe, though, that this would be the coastal encampment mentioned in Numbers 33, which lists all their campsites from Goshen to the Promised Land. If so, this fits perfectly because you have an oasis by the Red Sea, which is just past these trees. And we also have a Midianite fortress just across the valley here. And so we know during the time of the Exodus, people inhabited this area because of the water. And then Jethro's house city. Um, Just right up this valley. The well, it's, yeah. yeah, right up there. So so about, you know, 20 minute drive. Right. Yeah. So it kind of starts to fit. How rare are these oasis in, in these desert areas? Oh yeah, they're rare. There's so, not many of them. Yeah. So definitely they're taking advantage of where they can find them. As Moses, who was you know, a shepherd here for 40 years, he would know he where would these know. were located. Yeah, because it's literally just dry everywhere and all of a sudden, you have water coming out of the ground, yeah. you have little fish or tadpoles, palm trees. It's neat. I've never really been to an actual oasis. Yeah, here's one right in the middle of the desert beside the ocean. It's really beautiful yeah. here. In Illinois, we do have oasis, but they're restaurants over the expressway. So not quite the same as this, you know. Yeah, well, maybe you could get some food around here. So. Oh, that would be nice. Yeah, McDonald's here. <laughs> but you know, if you come down here, yeah, a lot of the locals, they uh, try to get samples of the water or they touch the water because, you know, this is what they believe Moses was at. Yeah, you can see how big the oasis is going all the way towards the sea. Wow. And even down into the valley this towards so the cool. fortress. Yeah. Oh, now I see the fort you're talking about. Yeah, it's pretty big. In fact, yeah. they say in the Saudi archeological literature, this is one of the most important Midianite sites in okay. this area. So they've identified it as Midianite. And again, yeah. that's probably by pottery. Correct. And other dating methods. And this would have been an important for it because it would protect. It's the protecting the water source. Water, uh, the yeah. water source, yeah. And you also have the coast here. That's true. They're keeping an eye on the coast. You're protecting the water. And so when the Israelites came through the area, they needed water. So they would have come to this oasis. Quite an extensive oasis. Yeah, and they actually have nice amenities here. Benches, yeah. garbage cans, bathrooms. They are getting ready for the Moses tour groups. <laughs> yeah, well. I think this is going to be a very popular area. Yeah, what a beautiful 
view of oh the Red goodness. Sea. Yeah. So again, we are just south of the Red Sea crossing. And in Numbers 33, in verse 9 and 10, it talks about this coastal campsite that the Israelites went to after Elam. Now this happens to be the only oasis on the coast in this area of Midian. And so that's why many researchers believe that this is where the Israelites ended up when they're going on their journey to Mount Sinai. They came through this. If there's an oasis somewhere, will that typically still be there thousands of years later? Yeah, in fact, you see a lot of these oasis, they're still around uh -huh. for thousands of years. Well, we know this one was here. Because of the because Midianite, of the Midianite. Fortress. Yep. Al-Bada, the same thing. You have these Midianite Islamic ruins. Even earlier, they say Neolithic, and it's still now a modern day town. Yeah. So, yeah. so you were talking about a gentleman that had come through here many years ago before YouTube and all of this has been more popularized. Yeah, in fact, there was a Turkish or Ottoman cartographer, so he was making maps of the Ottoman Empire about 300 years ago, uh, who came through this area of Northwest Saudi Arabia, and he reported about Magna, this oasis we're in right now, and he said that the locals showed him a rock nearby that they believed that Moses struck and the water came out. Hmm. And so in the biblical account, that is the rock of Horeb at the Rephidim camping site, mm -hmm. right before they went to Mount Sinai. So somewhere nearby was this rock that locals were showing him. And again, it just shows that they had this tradition of the Israelites coming through here mm -hmm. on the Exodus journey long before you had any modern uh, videos being made promoting these sites. And the locals, that would be a very typical thing that they would have oral traditions yes. passed down. It was just the thing they did. So that would not be surprising to you that that story has survived for thousands of years. Correct. Amazing. After Magna, the children of Israel would pass through Moses' father-in-law Jethro's hometown. Albad, the name of the town today, has several ruins and traditions that link to the Midians and Jethro. This is a museum, and this is in the place where Jethro, we think, might have lived. We're not talking about Beverly Hillbillies here. We're talking about the Jethro yes, um, of the Bible, of Moses, Moses', Moses father-in-law, father the priest yeah. of Midian. So what are the proofs that this is Midian? And how do we know that Moses would have come here? And that also sets up the crossing site. It sets up where the Mount Sinai would be, the Correct, Mount of God. Yeah. All of it focuses on this being Midian. Well, if you look at just the geography of Northwest Saudi Arabia, you'll notice that there are very limited water sources here mm -hmm. and that they have these major oases where people lived and uh, dwelt in because of the, the water and the greenery around for the sheep. And so it was in this one big oasis, now called al -Bada, that all the archeological evidence points to as this being Midian. We have the Midianite pottery. We have ancient maps, like from the time of the classic periods of the Roman and Greeks, that say this is the town of Midian. They took the land of Midian from the time of the Exodus. They converted it down and condensed it now to this town to that city. we're in. Okay. So you find that not just local tradition placing Moses and Jethro here, like they call him Swaib for Jethro in the Quran, mm -hmm. but you also have the archaeological evidence and the geography pinpointing this as being Midian. So it's very much undisputed that this is the land of Midian here. And then some of these ancient maps, you're still seeing that it's not accurate. Obviously, yeah. we have the advantage today of having you know, <laughs> satellite Earth, mapping yeah. and all this stuff. Some of the confusion of you know where is Sinai has been yeah. that they didn't depict the Gulf of Aqaba on these ancient maps. Yeah. So then when people were looking for where it would have been, it just, you know, they kind just, of fell in the wrong area. They just picked the Gulf of Suez because right. it's the only one they had on the maps. Right. And there's a lot of ruins here at this site, the tombs that are Nabataean, but they're yeah. also... You have, like, this photo, for example, shows what they call the Prophet Swaib, the tombs of Swaib there in Arabic. The facade, they're Nabataean-style tombs. The Nabataeans, they had an empire running from their capital in Petra, mm -hmm. Jordan, all the way down through this area that used to be Midian. Mm -hmm. And so they obviously reused the same places that the Midianites lived, the same oasis. They were in this area, just like the Midianites. Mm -hmm. What's interesting about this photo display, you actually see one of the very rare inscriptions that mention the name Midian. 
And so this is later after the time of the Exodus, but even you know, centuries later, they still associated this area as being Midian. And we see they had distinct pottery. Here's an example, they called it painted pottery because they had very fancy geometric patterns painted on these pottery pieces. And this is what they call Midianite pottery or painted ware because of the painted pottery. And you find this only from this area and it was distributed up into Israel, but you don't find this anywhere in the Sinai Peninsula, like the southern part of the Sinai Peninsula where people try to put Mount Sinai. There's no examples of this being down there. The Midianites came from, just probably descended from someone. They were from Abraham's third wife, Keturah. Right. So she was the lesser known wife of Abraham, uh -huh. but she had a number of children and they inhabited this area, their descendants, like oh. Dedan, Midian, this area of Northwest Saudi Arabia. You'll have some people try to say that the Midianites were nomads and those, they didn't really have a true home. And so maybe later, because like, they were traders, they, you know, they, they did long distance trading. Sure, but, but they uh, had to have had a home base. Right? Exactly. And, and they, they're not going to go super far with their and, flocks and stuff. Well, but you notice even the story of the Exodus, when Moses is at Rephidim with oh. the Israelites, the split rock, Jethro says he returned to his home or his land. Right. So he had a piece of land that he called his own, even though he was a right nomad. Here. He yeah. came back to this certain area of, of the modern day town of Albada, wow. right near the well probably. Amazing. <laughs> and he was you know, the high priest of Midian, so he, uh -huh. he had a location that people knew who he was. The Bible says high priest. Can you elaborate on that a little bit more? Did he have knowledge of the one true God? Would he have been a, a worshiper of the one true God? You know, uh, the Bible doesn't give a lot of details about what Jethro believed, but you'll notice that he was very friendly mm -hmm. to Moses and the Israelites. He helped them. He helped organize the Israelite system for the, you know, the judging. His daughter was married into the Israelite, the, the, like their distant cousins. Whether they had the correct understanding, 100% of the of the true God, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But uh, definitely, this is the area we believe that God put the mountain of. Moses, the Mount Sinai. There was something special so, about this that area. mountain. Mountain, yeah. of mountain of God, it just kind of says yeah. mountain of God before the burning yeah. bush, before Sinai. So there was already something about this place. Yeah, it's a mystery, because uh, you do have Moses just writing that he took the flocks of Jethro to the mountain of God. It doesn't say where the name came from or how long it was named that or why did God choose this mountain? It just <laughs> doesn't say. And, you know, there are... There are other places on the planet that are important to God. Jerusalem, of course, is the one. But there's something else very important here. He wanted his people to come here. The law, the tabernacle, you know, he's feeding them in the wilderness, the water. All of these things are happening right in this area. So there's something important to God about the spot that we're in. Yeah, I guess someday we'll have, hopefully find out in heaven. Yeah, yeah. Like, why was this chosen? Uh, There's a be... lot that I, I want to know. <laughs> yeah, we'll, have to, we'll ask Moses too. <laughs> yeah, we kind of stumble through, you know, thinking about stuff and then, you know, trying to do some research and all that. But there are still plenty of plenty of unanswerable oh, questions man, for sure. that uh, I think we'll spend eternity uh, learning more and yeah, more. Yeah, and about archaeology only gives you a little hint. And a lot of times they misinterpret archaeological data. And so I definitely will find out in heaven. <laughs> Next, we arrived at a well that some have ascribed to the location that Moses had fled to earlier in his life and had helped Jethro's daughters. So we're still in Albada. Yes. Which is where we think Jethro, Jethro lived. lived in okay. The home, like the capital of Midian, you could say. Yeah. One of the most important archaeological sites. Here. Yeah, Midian's an area, but it's also a the name kind of, of a town. central location, yeah. and that's where we are. And we're heading toward a well. Yeah, so this is known as the Well of Moses. Uh -huh. It's a, a local Islamic tradition that goes all the way back to the Middle Ages. Basically, they knew the story too, that Moses, when he fled uh, Pharaoh, he came to the land of Midian, and it said he sat down by a well. Moses wrote about this experience where he met his future wife, Zipporah. Oh. The Midianites lived around these 
water sources, mm -hmm. like these oases. And so they all had big wells where they could water their flocks. So and they had a well, and then also would they have like a, yeah. like a pool that they could fill ahead of time for the animals or something like that. Yeah, and you do find this here, even though this is a later time period, this is from the later Mamluk in the Islamic time period. Mm -hmm. But again, it, it's, it follows an older tradition of where you have a water source and you have water storage nearby so they could easily water their flocks by filling up the water storage. Well, let's recount that story of Moses coming here. Yeah, in Exodus, Moses wrote that he had to defend Jethro's daughters. They kind of said this was their well, okay. or they basically took over and said, we're gonna water our flocks first. The men. Yeah, these okay. other men. Uh -huh. And Jethro only had daughters. And so these women who were defenseless against these other local men, and so they had to wait basically until actually Moses showed up and he defended them huh. and he allowed them to water their flocks. And they got, I guess, so excited. It seems like they ran off and told the father, huh. Jethro, what happened. And he's like, well, where's this stranger? Where's this guy? Bring him over, right? Yeah, and they had left him at the well. <laughs> and then that begins a long time relationship, of course, marrying Zephora. Yeah, and, and Moses then ended up having two children here in the land of Midian while he was 40 years exiled here. Mm -hmm. he, he started a new uh, career as a shepherd. Huh. Imagine that going from basically a prince of Egypt yeah. to a shepherd. Uh, what a change. You know, I'm sure God had a lot to teach him and he had to unlearn a lot of stuff that he learned in Egypt mm -hmm. to become the leader to lead the Israelites out of Egypt. Hmm. Yeah, so you have a man who would have been very highly educated. Yeah right, uh, to be out here in the desert, yeah, just Matt, watching sheep. And the, the dumb sheep, you're trying to make sure they don't go off anywhere. Well, that's kind of what God says about us, right? All we like sheep have gone astray. Yeah. We have turned everyone to our own way. All right, well, show me the well. Yeah, we're just right up here against this side of rocks. We have this hole in the ground. And this is the well yes, this of is Moses. Where they believe Moses met Zipporah. Huh. Quite a, a deep well. In fact, it's big enough they have stairs spiraling down. So. Right, Spir stairs are carved in, and that is the way they would do the wells, right? Because that's give them access yeah. up and down. Water. And then they would have, most of the time though, they would have the water system where the buckets would draw it out and store it nearby. So you're not always pulling it out from here. Uh -huh. You have easier access from like a storage unit nearby or like a cistern. Yeah, and this well dates to around what time? Well, they say that the earliest they know of is the Islamic period, like the Middle Ages. But of course, we do know that this was an ancient oasis. They're finding pottery going back to Midian. Mm -hmm. And then before, they're finding evidence of people living here. So the general area has always had water, whether this was the specific well during the Exodus or not, it was in this general area. Okay, so we believe this would have been somewhere really close nearby where Jethro lived. Yeah, it was his hometown. Mm -hmm. It was here that Moses ended up settling for 40 years. Wow, wow. And he would have had, of course, a, a home, but they were also nomadic in that they would tend their flocks in different mm -hmm. areas, but it, was, yeah. it wouldn't have been too far away. It would have been either. Yeah, even today you have the Bedouins doing that based on the seasons and, and how the, the temperatures are. They'll move their flocks from the lower elevations to the higher mountains behind us here and find the locals doing that. And we believe that's what Moses was doing when he went to the mountain of God and saw the burning bush. Right, and the Bible says he went to the, what does it say, the backside of the wilderness? Or yeah, the like backside that. or the west side of the wilderness, right, right. depending on how you translate it. And so between here, the different ways you can look at it, if that is Mount Sinai over there on the mountain range, then between this oasis and the mountain is a wilderness. So on the backside from here would be Mount Sinai. And it's a distance that the sheep that a shepherd could go to a normal distance. It's not like he would have had to go all the way around the Gulf of Aqaba to the traditional Mount Sinai in Egypt today. Yeah. It doesn't make any sense. They right. don't, shepherds don't do that. Right, no, no, and you wouldn't do that. So it's a shorter transition, seasonal transition, yeah. looking for cooler temperatures, better vegetation, vegetation yeah. for the animals. What an awesome feeling it is to stand here where Moses likely stood, where he did something good. He defended women, you know, and he did the right thing. I love that when people in the Bible do the right thing. And Moses normally did. Most of the time he did the right thing. It must have felt good for him because he had just killed somebody. He flees his country, lost his position in the royal family. He must have been really depressed. 
Mm-hmm. And now he can help some local Midianite women. Yeah, and become part of a family. Uh, you know, yeah. you kind of lose your family. You come you find a new family. And they would have been distantly related too yeah. uh, through Abraham. So really amazing. I just get, I love the sense of history, the sense of the Bible coming to life. You know, this is far away from the land of Israel, but it all connects. This spot connects to Israel. Yeah, this is like their journey from Egypt. They didn't go straight to Israel, the Promised Land. God had them come out here to this wilderness location mm-hmm. to meet him on a mountain. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and he had a purpose for that. You know, the, the plan was for them to, to come out here and become a people, become a nation, to, to give laws. Uh, you know, all of these things transpired from this area. Even the tabernacle, the form of worship, the nationalness of Israel, and then they could have gone right then up into the promised land, yeah. of course, because of complaining. And it, it starts pretty much right away. You know, they had this yeah. big Red Sea miracle and wow, God is great. And then it isn't too long until you start to hear people complaining and murmuring. Yeah. And it happened over and over, unfortunately. It's a recurring pattern through the Exodus. And I think we can all see it in our own lives, how quickly we forget what God has done and how good he is. And we start complaining about something. A lot of lessons we learned from the Exodus story. Yeah, for sure. Today, we've seen much evidence that this is Midian, and therefore where Moses was taking the people to God's mountain where he had seen the burning bush. Next time, we're going to see more archaeological evidence that this is where Jethro and the Midians lived, as well as the split rock of Horeb and the real Mount Sinai itself.